Chapter 1 The Three Gifts of Monsieur Dardanian the Elder, Moong, a pretty market town on the Loire and the birthplace of Jean de Moong, author of The Romance of the Rose, was more or less used to disturbances of one sort or another because of the troublous times, but on the first Monday in April, 1625, it appeared as though all the armed hosts of the Huguenots had descended upon the place in order to make of it a second La Rochelle. The citizens, seeing the women fleeing over by the main street and hearing the abandoned children crying from the doorsteps, hurriedly donned their breastplates. Then, bolstering up their somewhat uncertain courage by seizing musket, axe or pike, they sped towards the hostelry at the sign of the Jolly Miller. There they found a compact ever swelling group, all agog, milling about, full of curiosity and clamor. Panics were frequent in France at that period. Few days passed without some city or another recording an event of this sort in its archives. There were the nobles fighting among themselves, the king making war upon the cardinal, and Spain battling against the king. Besides these conflicts, concealed or public, secret or patent, other rights were occasioned by brigands, beggars, Huguenots, wolves and knaves who attacked all comers. The citizenry always took up arms against brigands and wolves and knaves, often against the nobles and Huguenots, sometimes against the king, but never against the cardinal or Spain. Accordingly, custom being what it was, on the first Monday in April, 1625, the burghers of Moong, hearing the tumult and seeing neither the red and yellow standard of Spain nor the livery of the Cardinal Duc de Richelieu, rushed toward the sign of the Jolly Miller. One glance was enough to make clear to everybody what was causing all this hullabaloo. A young man, but let us sketch his portrait with one bold stroke of the pen. Imagine, then, the Don Quixote aged eighteen. The Don Quixote lacking breastplate coat of mail or thigh guards. A Don Quixote clad in a wool and doublet, its blue faded into an indefinable color that combined. A multitude of tints as dissimilar as the red of deepest burgundy and the most celestial azure. Dot his face was long, thin and tanned, the cheekbones high, a sign of astuteness, and the jaw wide, the infallible mark of a Gascon, whether he wears a beret or no. As a matter of fact, the youth wore a beret, adorned with a feather of sorts. His glance was frank and intelligent. His nose hooked but finely chiseled, too tall for an adolescent, too short for an adult. He looked like nothing so much as a farmer's son on a journey, were it not for the sword dangling from a belt of chagrin, which kept hitting against the calves of its owner when he walked and against the bristling flank of his steed when he rode. Our youth boasted a steed so noteworthy that no man could fail to take note of it. A burn nag, it was, twelve or fourteen years old, with a yellow coat and hairless tail, but not without swellings on its legs. As this nag walked with its head well below its knees, no martingale was necessary. Nevertheless, it managed to cover eight leagues a day regularly. Unfortunately the virtues of this horse were so well concealed under its weird coat and incongruous gait that, at a period when everybody was a connoisseur in horse flesh, its apparition at Moong, it had entered a quarter of an hour before by the gate of Bugency, created a sensation, and the discredit inspired by the beast naturally extended to its master. This fact proved it all the more painful to young Dardanian. To name the Don Quixote of this second rose in it, because he was himself forced to acknowledge how ridiculous such a steed made him. Excellent horseman though he was, indeed, yet he heaved a deep sigh as he accepted this gift from his father. He was aware, of course, that such a beast was worth at least twenty livres, but the words accompanying the gift were beyond all price. My son, said the old Gascon gentleman in the pure burn pat which Henry IV had never succeeded in shedding. My son, this horse was born in your father's house some thirteen years ago, and here it has remained ever since. This ought to make you love the beast, 
Never sell it. Let it die quietly and honorably of old age. If you should go to the wars with it, then care for it as faithfully as you would care for an old servant. At court, should you ever have the honor to go there, Monsieur Dardani and the elder continued, adding parenthetically that it was an honor to which his son's ancient nobility entitled him, be sure worthily, to uphold the name of gentleman which has been dutifully borne by your ancestors for more than five hundred years. Do this both for your own sake and for the sake of your own people. I mean your relatives and friends. Endure nothing from anyone save the cardinal and the king. Nowadays the gentleman makes his way by his courage. Do you understand? By his courage alone. Whoever trembles for but a second has perhaps lost the bait which fortune held out to him in precisely that second. You are young. You ought to be brave for two reasons. First because you are a Gascon and second because you are my son. Never avoid a quarrel. Seek out the hazards of high adventure. I have taught you how to wield a sword. You have muscles of iron and a wrist of steel. Fight at every opportunity. The more blithely because duels are forbidden and therefore it will be doubly brave of you to fight. After a pause, Dardanian's father went on. I have nothing to give you, my son, except fifteen crowns, my horse and the advice you have just heard. To these... Your mother will add a recipe for a certain balsam which she acquired from a gypsy woman. It possesses the miraculous virtue of curing all wounds which do not reach the heart. Take advantage of everything that comes your way. Live happily and long. Then, one word more, the old man added. I would wish to propose an example for you, not mine, to be sure. For I have never appeared at court. Besides... I took part in the religious wars as a volunteer. No. I mean Monsieur de Drive. He was formerly my neighbor. As a child, he had the honor of being a playmate of our king, Louis XIII, whom God preserve. Their games sometimes degenerated into battles in which the king did not always have the upper hand. The thumbs and thwacks he received from Monsieur de Trivel inspired His Majesty with much esteem and friendship for his former playmate. Later, Monsieur de Trivel fought against others, on his first journey to Paris, five times. From the death of the late king to the majority of the young king, seven times, excluding all the wars and the sieges he has been through. From that date until now. I do not know how many times, possibly one hundred. Thus despite all the dicks, ordinances musketeers, in other words, leader of a legion of Caesars highly esteemed by his majesty and dreaded by the cardinal, who is known to dread nothing. Better still, Monsieur de Treve learns ten thousand crowns per annum, which makes him a very great noble indeed. And he started from scratch just like you, go to him with this letter, and model your behavior upon his, in order to accomplish what he has accomplished, whereupon the old man buckled his own sword to his son's belt, kissed him tenderly on both cheeks, and gave him his blessing, leaving his father, the young man went to his mother's apartment where she awaited him with that sovereign remedy which, thanks to the advice we have reported, was subsequently to be employed so often. In this interview, the ducks were longer and more tender than in the other. It was not because Monsieur Dardanian failed to cherish his only son, but he was a man and he would have deemed it unworthy for a man to give way to his feelings, whereas Madame Dardanian was a woman, and more, a mother. So she wept copiously and, to the honor of Monsieur Dardanian the younger, Notwithstanding the efforts he made to remain as firm as a future musketeer should be, nature prevailed, and he too shed many tears, half of which he managed at great pains to conceal. That same day the youth set out on his journey equipped with his father's three gifts, namely, the fifteen crowns, the horse and the letter to Monsieur de Drive, as may well be imagined. The advice had been thrown into the bargain. With such a vid mechum, Dardanian was, morally and physically, an exact replica of Cervantes' hero. 
to whom we so aptly compared him when our duties as historian placed us under the necessity of sketching his portrait. The Spanish Don took windmills for giants and sheep for armies. His Gascon counterpart took every smile for an insult and every glance for a challenge. Accordingly from Tards in the Pyrenees all the way to Mung on the Loire, he kept his fist clenched or pressed his hand against the hilt of his sword ten times a day. Yet his fist did not crash down on any John nor did his sword issue from its scabbard. To be sure, the sight of the wretched nag excited many a smile as Dardanian rode by. But against the nag's flank rattled a sword of respectable length and over the sword gleamed an eye more ferocious than proud. Passers by therefore repressed their hilarity or, if hilarity prevailed over prudence, they attempted to laugh on one side of their faces only, as do the masks of the ancients. Thus Tardanian remained majestic and virgin in his susceptibility until he reached the inauspicious town of Mung. There, as he was alighting from his horse at the gate of the jolly miller, without anyone, host, waiter or ostler, coming to hold his stirrup, Dardanian spied, through an open window on the ground floor, a gentleman of fine figure and proud, though somewhat sullen mean. This person was talking to two others who appeared to be listening to him with great deference, Dardanian, fancying quite naturally according to habit, that he was the object of their conversation, listened attentively, this time Dardanian was only in part mistaken, he himself was not being discussed, his nag was, apparently the gentleman was treating his audience to an enumeration of all the nag's qualities, and the audience being highly respectful of the narrator, there were bursts of raucous laughter at every moment, if the suggestion of a smile sufficed to stir the ire of our Gascon we may readily imagine how this vociferous jollity affected him. However, Dardanian first wished to examine the insolent fellow who dared make mock of him. His haughty glance fell upon the stranger, a man of forty or forty-five years of age, pale of complexion, with piercing black eyes, a nose boldly fashioned and a black impeccably trimmed mustache, he wore a doublet and hose of violet, with trimming of light color and no other ornament save the customary slashes through which the shirt appeared, though new. His doublet and hose looked rumpled, like traveling clothes long packed in a portmanteau. Dardanian took in all these details with the speed of the most meticulous observer and also, doubtless, with an instinctive presentiment that this stranger was to exercise a powerful influence upon his future life. As Dardanian stared at the gentleman in violet, the latter was, uttering the most sagacious and profound commentary on the nag of burn. His two auditors roared with laughter, at which the narrator actually smiled. This time, there could be no doubt whatsoever. Dardanian had been truly insulted, convinced of it. He pulled his beret down over his eyes, and, attempting to copy certain courtly gestures he had picked up from noblemen traveling through Gascony, he stepped forward, his right hand on the hilt of his sword, his left against his hip, unfortunately fast as he moved, waxing angrier at every step, he seemed to become more confused, instead of the polite, lofty speech he had, prepared as a challenge. His tongue could produce nothing better than a vulgar exclamation which he topped off with a furious gesture. Look here, monsieur, he cried, look here, you, there, skulking behind that shutter. Yes, I mean you. Look here, tell me what you are laughing at, will you, and we can laugh together. The gentleman's gaze moved slowly away from the nag and slowly toward its master as though a certain lapse of time were requisite before he could understand how such extraordinary reproaches could be leveled at him. Then, when he could entertain no doubt on the matter, he frowned slightly. A moment later, in a tone of irony indescribable in its insolence, he replied, I am not aware that I was addressing you, monsieur. Never mind, countered Dardanian, exasperated by this medley of insolence and good manners. 
of convention and disdain, I was addressing you. The stranger at him again, smiled fleetingly as before, and, withdrawing from the window, walked slowly out of the inn. He took his stand two paces from Dardanian and stood there, rooted to the spot, staring at the horse. His tranquil manner and bantering air increased the hilarity of his auditors, who were still gathered around the window, watching the scene. Seeing him approach, Dardanian drew his sword a full foot out of its scabbard. Upon my word, this horse is certainly a buttercup, observed the stranger. Pursuing his investigations, his remarks were addressed to his audience at the window, apparently, he was quite unconscious of Dardanian's exasperation although the youth stood between him and his audience. This color is quite common in Botany but until now it has been very rare among horses. Laugh all you will at my horse, said Dardanian angrily. He recalled how his hero, Monsieur de Trivel, had ridden a bobtailed nag from the Midi to Fortune. I dare you to smile at his master. As you may judge from my cast of features, Monsieur, I do not laugh frequently, the stranger replied, but I intend to preserve the privilege of laughing whenever I please, is for me, cried Dardanion. I will brook no man's laughter when it irks me. Well, well, Monsieur I dare say you are right said the stranger edging away, but Dardanian was not the type of youth to suffer anyone to escape him, least of all a man who had ridiculed him so impudently, drawing his sword at long last and for cause, he ran after the stranger, crying, turn about, turn about, master jester, he challenged, must I strike you in the back, you strike me? The stranger surveyed the young man with astonishment and scorn. Come, lad, you must be crazy. Then, in subdued tones, as though talking to himself, what a bore, he sighed. What a fine this buck would be for his majesty. The royal musketeers are combing the country to recruit just such hot heads. He had barely finished speaking when Dardanian lunged at him so impetuously that this jest might have been his last. The stranger drew his sword, saluted Dardanian and took up his guard, but suddenly at a sign his two onlookers, backed up by the innkeeper, fell upon Dardanian with sticks, shovels and tongs. While this sudden onslaught held Dardanian, the stranger sheathed his sword as readily as he had drawn it. A plague upon these Gascons, he muttered, put him back on his orange nag and away with him. Not before I kill you, another Gascon boast. Really? These Gascons are incorrigible. Keep up the dance since that is what he wants. When he is tired, we will cry quits. But the stranger did not suspect of what stubborn stuff his late adversary was made. Dardanian was never one to knuckle under, so the fight went on for a few seconds more, until Dardanian, exhausted, dropped his broken sword. Simultaneously, the cudgel struck him squarely on the forehead, bringing him to the ground, bloody and almost unconscious. It was at this moment that the citizen Ray of Moon came flocking from all sides to the scene of action. The host, fearing a scandal, carried the wounded man into the kitchen where some trifling attentions were administered. As for the stranger, he had resumed his stand at the window whence he stared somewhat impatiently upon the mob. Obviously put out by all this bother, he seemed to resent the fact that the crowd would not disperse. Well, how is this madman doing? He inquired as the host poked his head through the door. Your Excellency is safe and sound, I trust, safe as a house and sound as a bell. My good host, but I am asking you what has happened to our young firebrand. He is better now. He fainted quite away and before he fainted, he gathered all his strength to challenge and defy you. Why, this fellow must be the devil in person. Oh no. Your Excellency, he is no devil. The host shrugged his shoulders disparagingly. We searched him and rummaged through his kit. All we found was one clean shirt and twelve crowns in his purse, which didn't stop him from cursing you roundly. He said that if this had happened in Paris instead of in Moong, you would have paid dearly for it. 
a prince of the blood, no less, incognito and full of threats. I have told your excellency all this so that you might be on your guard. Did he name any names? He slapped his pocket and said. What? He said. We shall see what Monsieur de Trivel thinks of this insult, apostrophe. Monsieur de Trivel? The stranger started. He struck his pocket and mentioned Monsieur de Trivel. Come, come, my dear host, why your young man was unconscious. I am sure you did not fail to look into this pocket. What did you find? A letter addressed to Monsieur de Trivel. Captain of the Musketeers, indeed. Exactly as I have the honor to tell your excellency, the innkeeper, who was not gifted with great perspicacity, failed to observe the other's expression as he received this news. The stranger moved away from the window, and frowning, the devil, he muttered, can Trivley have set this gasket on my trail? He is very young. Still, a sword thrust is a sword thrust, whatever the fencer's age. Besides, a youth arouses less suspicion than an older man. Then he fell into a deep silence. After several minutes, come, come, my good host, do please rid me of this crazy lad. I can't kill him and yet, his expression was cold and threatening, yet he is a great nuisance. Where is the fellow? Upstairs in my wife's room. They are dressing his wounds. Did you take his rags and kit up? Did he remove his doublet? All his stuff is downstairs in the kitchen, but if this young fool annoys you, he annoys me very much. He has caused an uproar in your hostelry, a thing which respectable people cannot abide. Go upstairs, man, make out my bill, and summon my lackey. What, is monsieur leaving us already? Of course. I told you to have my horse saddled. Have you done so? Yes, indeed, your excellency. Your horse is ready, saddled for you too, ride off. Good. Now do as I told you, Lord save us, the host said, examining the stranger. Can he be afraid of this stripling? He wondered. An imperious look from the stranger sent him about his business and, bowing humbly, he withdrew. My lady must on no account be seen, the stranger mused. She will be passing through here soon. In fact she's late already, I dare say I had better ride out to meet her, if only I knew what was in this letter to Trivel. Bumbling to himself, he made off for the kitchen. Meanwhile the host, certain that the youth's presence had driven the stranger from his hostelry, ran upstairs to his wife's room. There he found Dardanian who had at last come to suggesting that the police would handle the youth pretty roughly for having picked a quarrel with the great lord, for he had no doubt that the stranger could be nothing less. The host persuaded Dardanian, weak though he was, to get up and to be off. Dardanian rose. He was still only half conscious. He had lost his doublet, and his head was swathed in a linen cloth, propelled by the innkeeper. He worked his way downstairs. But as he reached the kitchen, the first thing he saw was the stranger, standing at the step of a heavy carriage with two large Norman horses in harness. He was chatting urbanely with the lady who leaned out of the window of the coach to listen. She must have been about twenty years of age. Dardanian was no fool. At a glance, he perceived that this woman was young and beautiful beauty the more striking because it differed so radically from that of the midi, where he had always lived. She was pale and fair, with long curls falling in profusion over her shoulders. She had large blue, languishing eyes, rosy lips and hands of alabaster. She was talking vivaciously to the stranger, so his eminence orders me, to return to England at once. Should the Duke leave London you are to report directly to his amendments. Any other instructions? The fair traveller asked. They are in this box here. You are not to open it until you have crossed the channel. Very well. And you? What will you do? I go back to Paris. Without chastising this insolent youth, the lady objected. The stranger was about to reply, but before he could open his mouth, Dardanian, who had heard all, bounded across the dorsal. 
This insolent youth does his own chastising, he cried, and this time, I trust, chastisement will not escape him. Will not escape him? The stranger echoed, frowning, with a woman present, I dare hope you will not run away again. The stranger grasped the hilt of his sword. My lady, seeing this, cautioned, remember that the least delay may ruin everything. You are right, my lady. Let us go our several ways. Bowing to the lady, he sprang into his saddle. The coachman whipped up his horses and galloped off in one direction. The stranger was ready to gallop off in the other when suddenly the host appeared, seeing his great lord about to disappear without settling his score. Mine host's affection yielded to the most profound contempt. What about my bill? He shouted. Pay him, dolt, said the stranger to his lackey tossing a purse to him as they cantered off. The lackey checked his mount, flung three or four silver coins at the host's feet, and sped after his master. Oh, you coward, you wretch, you bogus gentleman, cried the Ardanian, springing forward in turn after the lackey, but his wounds had left him too weak to bear the strain of such exertion. He had not taken ten steps before he felt his ears ringing. A giddiness swept over him. A cloud of blood rolled over his eyes, and he fell in the middle of the street, crying, Coward, 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 the coward he is. Mine host agreed as he went to Dardanian's aid, flattering him as the hero of the fable flattered the snail he had scorned the evening before. Eh, he's a coward, a base coward. Dardanian murmured, but the lady, how beautiful she was, who, my lady, Dardanian faltered, as he fainted once again, well, thought the host, I've lost two clients but I still have this one, I'm certain to keep him for a few days, that means eleven crowns to the good, eleven crowns representing the exact sum that remained in, Dardanian's purse. The innkeeper had reckoned Dardanian's convalescence at one crown per day for eleven days, but mine host had reckoned without his guest. Dardanian rose next day at five o'clock, went down to the kitchen and aided and requested several things. First, he asked for certain ingredients, the nature of which have not been transmitted to us. Then he asked for wine, oil and rosemary, and, his mother's recipe in hand. He concocted a balsam with which he anointed his numerous wounds. He himself laid compress after compress upon them, steadfastly refusing the assistance of any physician. Doubtless, thanks to the efficacy of the gypsy salve, and perhaps to the absence of any medico, Dardanian felt much restored that evening and practically cured on the morrow. Dardanian prepared to settle his score. His only extras were for the rosemary, oil and wine. The master had fasted while the yellow nag according to the innkeeper had eaten three times as much as a nag of such proportions could possibly assimilate. In his pocket Dardanian found only his worn velvet purse and the eleven levers which it contained. As for the letter to Monsieur de Treville, it had vanished. He began to search for it with utmost patience to turn his pockets and gussets inside out over and over, to rummage time after time in his bag, to ransack his purse, opening it, closing it, and opening it again and again. Dot then, convinced at last that the letter was not to be found, he flew for the third time into such a fit of fury that he might easily have required a fresh supply of wine and aromatic oils. Mine host saw this young firebrand on the rampage and heard him vow to tear down the establishment if his letter were not forthcoming. Immediately he seized a spit, his wife a broom, and his servants the very cudgels they had used two days before. Give me my letter. Dardanian kept shouting, Give me my letter or by the holy blood. I'll spit you through like Hortolans. Unfortunately there was one circumstance which prevented him from carrying out his threat. His sword had been broken in two during his first conflict, a fact which we have chronicled but which he had completely forgotten. Accordingly when Dardanian sought to draw his blade, he found himself armed with no more than a stump eight or ten inches long, 
which the innkeeper carefully replaced in his scabbard. As for the rest of the blade, the host had pockily set it aside in order to make of it a larding pin. Great as his disappointment was, it would probably not have deterred our young hothead if the innkeeper had not realized that the objection was perfectly justified. Yes, that's true, said mine host, flowering his spit. Where is that letter? Eh, where is that letter? D'Artagnan repeated. Let me tell you that letter was addressed to Monsieur de Trive. It must be found and if it isn't, Monsieur de Trive will know the reason why. This thread completed the intimidation of the innkeeper. After the king and the cardinal, Monsieur de Trivel was probably the most important figure in the realm, a constant subject of discussion among soldiers and even citizens. To be sure there was also the famous Father Joseph, but his name was never breathed above a whisper. So great was the terror inspired by the gray eminence, to give the cardinal's familiar his popular nickname. Throwing down his spit and ordering his wife and servants to cast away their respective weapons, the innkeeper himself inaugurated the search for the missing document. Was there anything valuable in your letter? He asked after a few moments of futile endeavor. God's blood I should say so, cried the Gascon. Had he not been counting on this letter to speed his advancement at court? It contained my whole fortune. Drafts on the Spanish treasury? Mine host asked with a worried air. No, Dardanian answered. Drafts on the privy treasury of His Majesty of France. Having expected to enter the king's service on the strength of this recommendation, he believed himself justified in hazarding this somewhat misleading reply without incurring the stigma of lying. God help us all, wailed the host, it is of no moment. Dardanian said with true Gascon phlegm, it is of no moment, money means nothing to me. He paused, but that letter meant everything. I would rather have lost one thousand pistoles than that letter. He might as readily have risked twenty thousand but a certain youthful modesty restrained him, just as the innkeeper, finding no trace of the letter, was about to commit himself to the devil. A ray of light pierced his skull. That letter is not lost he said. What? That letter is not lost. It was stolen from you. Stolen? Who stole it? The gentleman who was here yesterday. He came down here to the kitchen where you left your doublet. He was alone here for quite a while. I'll wager he stole your letter. You think so? Dardanian asked. He was somewhat skeptical for he knew the letter better than anybody else. It was purely personal. How then could it have become valuable enough to steal? No servant, no traveler could have gained anything by possessing it. You say you suspect that impertinent gentleman? Sure as I stand here. I told him you, monsieur, were the protege of monsieur de Trivel. I said you even had a letter for this illustrious gentleman. Well, the stranger looked very much disturbed. He asked me where the letter was and went straightway down to the kitchen. He knew your doublet was there. He's the thief, then. Dardanian scowled. I shall complain to Monsieur de Trivel. And Monsieur de Trivel will complain to the king. Majestically, he drew two crowns from his purse, handed them to the innkeeper, and made for the gate. Mine host close on his heels. Hat in hand, the yellow nag awaited him. He leapt into the saddle and rode off. His steed bore him without further misadventure to the Port Saint Antoine, the northern gate of Paris, where its owner sold it for three crowns, an excellent price. Considering that Dardanian had pressed it hard during the last stage of his journey, the dealer to whom Dardanian sold it for the aforesaid nine levers did not fail to make it clear that he was dispersing this exorbitant sum solely because of the originality of the beast's color. So Dardanian entered Paris on foot, carrying his kid under his arm, roaming the city until he found a room suited to his scanty means. It was a sort of garret situated in the Rue des Fossilers, Grave a Digger's Row, near the Luxembourg Palace, having paid a deposit. 
Dardanian took possession of his lodging and spent the rest of the day sewing. His specific task was to stitch on to his doublet and hose some ornamental braiding which his mother had ripped off an almost new doublet of her husband's and given to her son secretly. Next he repaired to the Quai de la Ferraille to have a new blade put to his sword. Then he walked back toward the Louvre, to ask the first musketeer he met where Monsieur de Trivel's mansion was. It proved to be in the Rue du Vieux Colombier, quite close to where Dardanian had taken a room. The circumstance appeared to him to augur well for the success of his journey. After this, gratified with the way in which he had behaved at Mung, clear of all remorse for the past, confident in the present and full of hope for the future, he retired to bed and slept the sleep of the valiant. This sleep, the sleep of one who was still a provincial, occupied him till morning. At nine o'clock he rose, dressed and set out for the mansion of the illustrious Monsieur de Trivel, the third personage in the kingdom, according to Monsieur Dardanian the Elder. Chapter 2 The Antechamber of Monsieur de Trivel Monsieur de Troiril, as his family was still called in Gascony, or Monsieur de Trivel, as he had ended by styling himself in Paris had begun life exactly as Dardanion. He had marched on the capital without a suit to his name, but he possessed that wealth of audacity, shrewdness and intelligence whereby the poorest and humblest Gascon gentleman often derives brighter hopes from his paternal heritage than the richest and loftiest nobleman from Perigord or Barry realizes materially from his, his insolent bravery. His still more insolent success at a time when blows were thick as hops, sped him to the top of that difficult ladder called court favor. He had scaled it four steps at a time. Monsieur de Trivel was a friend of the reigning king, Louis XIII, who, as is well known, venerated the memory of his father, Henry IV. Now Monsieur de Trivel's father had served Henry IV with unfailing loyalty during the wars of religion. The monarch could not reward him in coin of the realm, for he was short of that commodity all his life long and he used to pay his debts with the only staple he never had cause to borrow, a ready wit. So Henry of Navarre, having captured Paris and become king of France, being short of money, as we have said authorized the late Monsieur de Trivel to assume for arms a lion or patent upon gules, in non-heraldic terms a golden lion walking and looking towards the right, with right for praised, with a motto of Fidelis et Fortis, loyal and brave. This was of course a very great honor but it scarcely made for creature, comfort, so that when the illustrious comrade of Henry IV died, he left his son his sword and his motto for only inheritance, thanks to this double gift and the spotless name that accompanied it. Monsieur de Trivel was admitted into the household of the young prince. There he made such good use of his sword and proved so faithful to his motto that King Louis XIII, one of the good swordsmen of his kingdom, was wont to exclaim, Had I a friend about to fight? I would advise him to choose me in the first place to support him, then Trivel, or no, perhaps Trivel in the first place, then myself. Thus Louis XIII had a genuine liking for Trivel, a royal and selfish liking, true, but a liking nevertheless. At that unhappy period, it was important for the great to be surrounded by men made of such stuff as Trivel. Many might take for a model the epithet of brave which formed the second part of Trivel's motto, but few gentlemen could boast that of loyal, which constituted the first. Trivel was of this small group, and high among them for the rare combination of virtues that were his. He was intelligent, obedient and tenacious as a bulldog and blindly passionate in his valor. Quick of eye and prompt of hand, he seemed to have been endowed with sight only to discern who displeased the king and with an arm only to strike down the culprit, whether a bosom, a morevers, a paltrot, a mere or a vitry. In short, until now, Trivel had lacked nothing save the golden opportunity, but he had lain in wait for it and vowed to seize it by its three hairs if ever it came within reach. It did, and the sovereign appointed Trivel captain of his musketeers. 
who in devotion or rather in fanaticism were to Louis XIII what his ordinaries had been to Henry III and his Scots guards to Louis XI. Monsignor Cardinal, Duc de Richelieu, did not lag behind the king in this respect, seeing the impressive elite Louis XIII had recruited, this second, or shall we say this first, the cardinal, as actual ruler of France, determined to have his own private guard too. Thus there were two corps of guards, the kings and the cardinals, and these two powerful rivals vied with each other in attracting the most celebrated swordsmen, not only from all the provinces in France but from all the foreign states, over their evening game of chess. Cardinal and king argued the merits of their respective soldiery, each vaunting the elegance and valor of his own, officially. They condemned all duels and brawling but privately they incited their henchmen to quarrel, deriving immoderate pleasure in victory or cute chagrin in defeat. For this statement, we have the authority of a gentleman whose memoirs attest that he was involved in some few of these defeats but in many more of these victories. Trivel knew how to appeal to and profit by his master's foibles. His Skill in appraising these explains how he enjoyed the long and steadfast favor of a monarch whom history does not record as particularly faithful in his friendships. He paraded his musketeers before Armand Duplessis, Cardinal and Duke, with a defiant air that made his eminence's gray mustaches bristle with impotent anger. Trivel had an admirable grasp of the war methods of his period. He realized that when soldiers could not live at the enemy's expense they must live off their fellow countrymen. His men formed a legion of devil-may-care fellows, quite undisciplined except in regard to their commanding officer, loose in their ways, great drinkers, battle scarred, his majesty's musketeers, or rather Monsieur de Trivels, roamed the city. They were to be seen lounging in the taverns strolling in the public walks and attending all civic sports and entertainments, shouting, whirling their moustachos and rattling their swords. They took immense pleasure in jostling the guards of Monsignor Cardinal when they met, then they would draw their swords in the open street, amid a thousand jests, as though it were all the greatest sport in the world. Sometimes they were killed, but they died certain of being mourned and avenged, often they did the killing but they were certain of not languishing in jail, for Monsieur de Trivel was there to claim them. Obviously then they praised their commanding officer to the skies, they adored him, and, ruffians though they were, they trembled before him like schoolboys before the magister, submissive to his least words. They were prepared to suffer death in order to wash out the slightest affront. Monsieur de Trivel employed this powerful weapon on behalf of the king and the king's friends in the first place. Then, in the second place on behalf of himself and his own friends. For the rest, no line in the memoirs of a period so fertile in memoirs, even those left by his enemies, accuses this worthy gentleman of acquiring personal profit from the cooperation of his minions, and heaven knows. He had enemies aplenty among both riders and soldiers, gifted with a genius for intrigue which made him a match for the ablest intriguers, he remained a model of probity and honor, more, despite grueling training in murderous duels, Monsieur de Trivel had become one of the most gallant frequenters of boudoirs, the most subtle squire of dames and the most exquisite turner of pretty compliments of his day. Monsieur de Trivel's triumphs in the lists of Venus were as widely bruited as those of Basso Pierre twenty years before, and that was saying a good deal. The captain of the musketeers was therefore admired, feared and loved, a state which constitutes the zenith of human fortune. Louis XIV absorbed all the smaller stars of his court in his own vast radiance, but his father, Pluribus Imper, more accommodating, suffered each of his favorites to retain his personal splendor, and each of his courtiers his individual value. Besides the levies of the king and the cardinal, Paris at that time boasted more than two hundred others, minor ones but much frequented. Among these, 
Monsieur de Trèvel's levy was one of the most avidly sought after, in summer from six o'clock in the morning, in winter from eight. The courtyard of his mansion in the Rue du Vieux-Colombe resembled an armed camp. Groups of fifty or sixty musketeers appeared to replace one another in relays so as always to present an imposing number. They paraded ceaselessly, armed to the teeth and prepared for any eventuality. In quest of favors, the office seekers of Paris sped up and down one of those colossal staircases within whose space our modern civilization could build an entire house. There were gentlemen from the provinces eager to enroll in the musketeers and flunkies in brilliant, multicolored liveries bringing and bearing back messages between their masters and Monsieur de Drive. In the antechamber on long circular benches sat the elect, that is to say those fortunate enough to have been summoned. A perpetual buzzing reigned in this room from morning till night while Monsieur de Trivel, in an adjoining office, received visits listened to complaints and gave his orders, to review both his men and his arms. He had but to step to his window, much as at the Louvre the king had but to step out on his balcony. The day Dardanian appeared at the Hotel de Trivel the assemblage was most imposing, particularly for a provincial newly arrived from his distant province. True, this provincial was a Gascon and at that period Gascons were reputed to be difficult to impress. Entering through the mass of a door with its long, square studs, he walked into the midst of a troop of swordsmen crossing one another as they passed, calling out, quarreling and playing tricks on one another. Only an officer, a great lord or a pretty woman could have moved through these turbulent, clashing waves of humanity. Young Dardanian advanced with beating heart through this tumult and confusion, holding his long rapier tight against his lanky leg and keeping one hand on the brim of his felt hat with the half-smile of your provincial who wishes to cut a figure. Having got past one group, he breathed more easily but he realized that people were turning round to stare at him, and, for the first time in his life, Dardanian, who had hitherto entertained a very good opinion of himself, felt ridiculous. Things were still worse when he reached the staircase to be confronted with the following scene. Four musketeers were amusing themselves fencing. Three were on the bottom steps, a fourth some steps above them. He, naked sword in hand, prevented or attempted to prevent the three from ascending, as they plied their agile swords against him. Ten or twelve comrades waited on the landing to take their turn at this sport. At first Dardanian mistook these weapons for foils and believed them to be buttoned, but he soon recognized by the scratches inflicted that every weapon was pointed as needle and razor sharp. Incidentally, at each scratch one of the fencers dealt an adversary. Both spectators and the actors themselves roared with laughter. The soldier temporarily defending the upper step kept his adversaries marvelously in check. The circle about the fencers grew denser as fresh candidates swelled the audience. The rules of the game were that when a man was hit, he must yield his turn to another candidate, and the man who hit him received an extra turn. In five minutes, the defender of the stairway pinked three men very slightly, one on the wrist, another on the chin, and the third on the ear, while he himself remained intact. This feat, according to the rules, won him three extra turns, however difficult it might be, or rather, however difficult Dardanian pretended it might be, for them to impress him, this pastime left him gaping, in his home province, a land where every man is a hothead, he had seen somewhat more elaborate preliminaries before dueling, the Gasconade, that is, the impetuosity, courage, calm and swagger of these four fencers, eclipsed anything he had ever witnessed even in Gascony. It was as though he had been transported into that famous realm of giants which Gulliver was later to visit and where he was to be so frightened. But Dardanian had not yet reached his goal. He had still to cross the landing and the antechamber. At the head of the stairs, the musketeers were not fighting, they were exchanging stories about women. 
In the antechamber they were exchanging stories about the court, on the landing, Dardanian blushed. In the antechamber he shuddered, in Gascony his lively and vagrant imagination had rendered him formidable to young chambermaids and even sometimes to their young mistresses, but even in his most delirious moments, he had never dreamed of half the amorous wonders or a quarter of the feats of dalliance which he heard exposed here with no detail omitted or attenuated, in connection with the loftiest names of the realm, but if his love of decency was shocked on the landing, his respect for the cardinal was scandalized in the antechamber, there, to Dardanian's amazement, they were loudly and boldly criticizing the policy which made all Europe tremble, worse, they blamed the private life of the cardinal, blithely indifferent to the fact that so many powerful nobles had been punished mercilessly for merely attempting to learn something about it. What, was it possible that the great man whom Monsieur Dardanian the Elder revered so deeply served as an object of ridicule to Monsieur de Treville's musketeers? Dardanian could scarcely believe his ears as he heard these soldiers cracking jokes about his eminence's bandy legs and his eminence's crooked back. Some sang scurrilous lampoons about Madame de Guillain, his mistress, and Madame de Cambilla, his niece. Others formed parties and laid plans to annoy the pages and guards of Monsignor Duke and Cardinal. However when by chance the king's name was thoughtlessly uttered amid all these cardinals' jests, it was as though a gag had suddenly been clamped down over all these jeering mouths. The speakers glanced hesitantly about them apparently doubting the thickness of the partition separating them from Monsieur de Treville's office, but a fresh illusion soon brought the conversation back to his eminence and then laughter waxed boisterous as ever and a bright, cruel light was shed upon the least of his actions. Upon my word, these fellows will all be imprisoned and hanged, Dardanian thought, he was terrified, and that will be my fate, too. I have been listening to them and I have heard them, I shall undoubtedly be held as an accomplice, what would my good father say, father who so earnestly counseled respect for my lord cardinal, what would my good father say if he knew I was in the society of such heathens, needless to say, then, Dardanian dared not join in the conversation, but he was all eyes and all ears jealous lest he miss the merest detail, despite his faith in the paternal injunction, his tastes and instincts led him to praise rather than to blame the unheard of things he was witnessing, although a stranger in the throng of Monsieur de Treville's courtiers and making his first appearance in this antechamber, Dardanian was finally noticed, a flunky went up to him and asked what he wanted, Dardanian gave his name very modestly, Emphasize the fact that he was a fellow countryman of Monsieur de Trevelin requested a moment's audience. The servant with a somewhat patronizing air promised to transmit his request in due season. Dardanian, recovering from his first surprise, now had leisure to examine the persons and costumes of those about him. The center of the most lively group was a very tall, body looking musketeer dressed in so peculiar a costume as to attract general attention. He was not wearing the uniform cloak. It was not compulsory in those days of less liberty and more independence, but, instead, a sky blue doublet, somewhat faded and worn, and over it, a long cloak of crimson velvet that fell in graceful folds from his shoulders, across his chest, from over his right shoulder to his left hip blazed a magnificent baldric, worked in gold and twinkling like rippling waters in the sun. From it hung a gigantic rapier. This musketeer had just come off guard, coughed affectedly from time to time and complained of having caught a cold. That was why he was wearing his cloak, he explained to those around him, speaking with a lofty air and whirling his mustaches disdainfully. Everyone admired his gold-braided baldric. Dardanian more than anyone, after all, baldrics are coming into fashion, said the musketeer, it was wildly extravagant of me, but still they're the fashion, besides, a man must spend his inheritance somehow, come, Porthos, 
Don't try to tell us your baldric comes from the paternal coffers. Another musketeer piped up, I know better. What? It came from the heavily veiled lady I met you with two Sundays ago over by the Port St. Donner. No, by my honor. I bought it myself. The man designated as Portos protested, on my faith as a gentleman, I paid for it out of my own purse. Yes, said a bystander, just as I bought this new purse with the money my mistress put in my old one. It's true, though, Portos insisted. The proof of it is that I paid twelve pistoles for it. The general wonderment grew but the general doubt subsisted. Didn't I? Aramis, he concluded. Turning to still another musketeer, the companion whose corroboration he invited offered a perfect contrast to Portos. Aramis was a young man twenty-three years old at most with a delicate and ingenuous countenance. Black gentle eyes. Cheeks rosy and downy as an autumn peach. And tenuous mustaches that marked a perfectly straight line over his upper lip. Don't he seemed mortally afraid to lower his hands lest their veins swell up, he would pinch his earlobes from time to time to preserve their smooth, rosy transparency. Usually he spoke little and always slowly, he bowed frequently and laughed noiselessly, bearing beautiful white teeth which he seemed to care for as attentively as he cared for the rest of his person, at his friend's appeal. He nodded affirmatively, another musketeer changed the subject. Addressing no one in particular, what do you think of the Chalice incident? He inquired, is Esquire is telling the strangest tale? And what does the Esquire say? Portos asked pompously. He says he was in Brussels and there he met Trockefort, the aim damnee of the Cardinal. And guess in what circumstances? Well, Rockyford was disguised as a Capuchin friar. Damn his soul, thanks to his costume he was able to trick Monsieur de Laigues, fool that he is. De Laigues is a fool, certainly, Portos conceded. But is this news reliable? I had it from Aramis. You did? Why yes, Portos, I told you all about it yesterday. Let's drop the subject. Drop the subject? Portos thundered. That's your opinion. He drew a deep breath. Drop the subject. Indeed, a plague on you. You draw your conclusions too quickly. What? The cardinal sets a spy upon a gentleman? The cardinal has this gentleman's letters stolen from him by a traitor. A brigand. A gallows bird? With the help of this scoundry land. Thanks to this correspondence. The cardinal has the head of Monsieur de Chalais severed skillfully from his shoulders, and you say drop the subject, apostrophe, and under what pretext does the cardinal execute Chalais? Under the stupid pretext that Chalais plotted to kill the king and marry off Monsieur, the king's brother, to our queen, no one knew a word about this intrigue. Yesterday you unraveled it to our general satisfaction, and now... While we are still gaping at the news, you say, let's drop the subject, apostrophe. Very well. Then, Aramis agreed, since you wish it, let us discuss the matter. Were I the esquire of poor Monsieur de Chalice, Portos blustered, I would give that criminal Rockefeller a pretty hard time of it for a minute or two. Yes, I know. Aramis countered suavely, and you would get a pretty hard time of it yourself from the Red Duke. The Red Duke, bravo, bravo. The Red Duke, Portos cried, clapping his hands and nodding approval. The Red Duke, what a capital coiner of mo you are, my dear Aramis. I shall make it my business to put that epithet in circulation all over the city. You may be sure, what a wit this lad Aramis is. What a pity you did not follow your early vocation. What a delightful abbe you would have made. A temporary postponement. Aramis answered, picking imaginary dust off his sleeve. Someday I shall be a priest. Why do you suppose I am going on with my theological studies? A, eh? a priest he'll be. Sooner or later. Sooner. Another musketeer intervened. Aramis is waiting for one thing before he dons a cassock hanging behind his uniform. What is that? For the queen to produce an heir to the throne of France. That is no subject for jesting. Porto subjected, 
Thank God the Queen is still of an age to bear a child. My Lord Buckingham is said to be in France. The fleeting, sharp smile that accompanied this apparently simple statement left it open to a somewhat scandalous interpretation. Aramis, my friend, this time you are wrong. Your wit is forever leading you astray. If Monsieur de Trivle heard you, you would rue it. Are you presuming to lecture me, Bortles? No, I. A flash of lightning blazed in the eyes of Aramis. Eyes habitually so placid and kindly. Well, my dear Aramis, make up your mind. Are you to be an abbé or a musketeer? Be one or the other. Not both. Porthos paused. You know what Athos told you the other day? He said you were all things to all men. Aramis raised his arm violently. Come, let us not get angry. Porthos continued. You know what Athos... You and I have agreed upon. Well, you visit Madame d'Aguil and to pay court to her. You visit Madame de Bois Tracy and you pay court to her, too. May I remind you that she is a cousin of Madame de Chevreuse? Rumor has it that you are quite far advanced in the good graces of Madame de Bois Tracy. Again, Aramis made an impatient gesture. Good Lord, don't bother to tell us about your luck with the ladies. No one wants to discover your secret. Everybody knows you for a model of discretion. But since you possess that virtue, why the devil not apply it when you speak of Her Majesty the Queen? I don't care who plays fast and loose with king or cardinal, but the Queen is sacred. If a man speaks of her, let it be with respect. Aramis looked at his friend. He sighed. Portos, he declared, you are vain as Narcissus. I have told you this before, I tell you again, you know how I loathe moralizing, unless Athos does it. As for yourself, my fine friend, your baldric is far too magnificent to chime with your philosophy. If I care to become an abbé, I shall do so. Meanwhile I am a musketeer and as such I shall say what I please. At this moment, I am pleased to say that I find you very boring, Aramis, Portos. Their comrades with hastily interfered. Come, come, gentlemen, stop, Portos. Look, Aramis, after all, he didn't mean it. Now, now, the door of Monsieur de Treville's study flew open. A lackey stood on the door sill. Monsieur de Treville will receive Monsieur Dardanian, he announced. The door being open, those in the Andy chamber suddenly stopped talking, amid the general silence. Dardanian walked across the room and entered the office, congratulating himself with all his heart at having so narrowly escaped the end of the extraordinary altercation. Chapter 3 The Audience Though Monsieur de Treville was in a very bad humor at the moment, he greeted his young caller politely. Dardanian bowed to the G-round and in his sonorous Spurin accent paid his profound respects. His southern intonation and diction reminded Monsieur de Treville of both his youth and his country, a twofold remembrance which brings a smile to the lips of any man, old or young. But before bidding Dardanian to be seated, Monsieur de Treville stepped toward the antechamber, waving his hand toward Dardanian as though to ask his permission to finish with other business before he began with him. Standing by the open door, Monsieur de Treville called the three names. At each name, his voice gained in volume so that he ran the gamut between command and anger. Athos, Portos, Aramis. At his summons, only two soldiers appeared. The musketeer of the gold and baldric and the musketeer who would be an abbé. No sooner had they entered than the door closed behind them, though they were not quite at ease. Dardanian admired their bearing, they were at once carefree dignified and submissive, in his eyes they were as demigods and their leader an Olympian Jove, armed with all his thunderbolts. Dardanian took stock of the situation. The two musketeers were here now, the door closed behind them, and the hum of conversation in the antechamber rose again. Doubtless revived by speculation about why Portos and Aramis were on the carpet, Monsieur de Treville was pacing up and down in silence. His brows knit, he covered the entire length of his office, back and forth, three or four times, passing directly in front of the musketeers. 
who stood smartly at attention, as if on a parade. Suddenly he stopped squarely in front of them, wheeled round to face them, and, surveying them angrily from top to toe, Do you gentlemen know what the king said to me no later than yesterday evening? He demanded, Do you know, gentlemen? There was a moment's silence, then one of them replied, No. No, monsieur. We do not. I hope that monsieur will do us the honor to tell us. Aramis suggested in his most honeyed tone as he made a deep bow. He told me that from now on he would recruit his musketeers from among the cardinal's guards. The cardinal's guards? Aramis asked indignantly. But why, monsieur? Because his majesty realizes that his inferior wine needs improving by blending it with a better vintage. The two musketeers blushed to the roots of their hair. Dardanian, completely in the dark about what was happening and considerably embarrassed, wished himself a hundred feet underground. A, eh? Monsieur de Treville went on, growing angrier apace. His Majesty was perfectly right, for upon my word, the musketeers certainly cut a sorry figure at court. Do you know what happened yesterday evening when His Eminence was playing chess with the King? Well, I'll tell you. Dot. His eminence looked at me with a commiserating air which frankly vexed me. Then he told me that my daredevil musketeers, those daredevils, he repeated with an irony that vexed me even more, had required disciplining. Then, his tiger cat I cocked at me, he informed me that my swashbucklers had made a night of it in a tavern in the roof Rue and that a patrol of his guards, I thought he was going to laugh in my face had been forced to arrest the rioters. Monsieur de Treble paused for breath. Morbleu, God's death? You must know something about it. He resumed. My musketeers, arrested. And you were among them. Don't deny it. You were identified and the cardinal named you. But it's all my own fault, eh? It's my own fault because it is I who choose my men. Come, Aramis. Tell me why the devil you asked me for a musketeer's uniform when a cassock would have suited you so much better, and you, Bortles, of what use is that fine golden baldric of yours if all it holds up is a sword of straw, and a thos, dot by the way, where is Athos, monsieur? Aramis explained mournfully. Athos is ill, very ill, ill, you say, what's the matter with him? We're afraid it's chicken pox, monsieur. Porthos improvised, determined at all costs to take part in the conversation, but we hope not, because it would certainly disfigure him. The pox. There's a cock and bull story. Porthos. Chicken pox at his age. No, I know better. He was probably wounded or killed, I dare say. Oh, if only I knew what has happened to him. Monsieur de Treville began pacing his office again then turned fiercely on the culprits, sank do, gentlemen, God's blood, I will not have my men haunting disreputable places, I will not have them brawling in the streets, and I will not have them fighting at every street corner, above all, I will not have them make themselves the laughing stocks of Monsignor Cardinal's guards, these guards are decent fellows, they are law-guiding and tactful. They do not put themselves in a position to be arrested, and if they did, I swear it. They wouldn't allow themselves to be arrested, they would prefer dying in their tracks to yielding an inch, whereas self-preservation, flight and surrender, he sneered, seem to be the watchwords of His Majesty's musketeers. During his long censure, Portos and Aramis were shaking with rage. They would cheerfully have strangled Monsieur de Trivle had they not felt that it was the great love he bore them made him speak thus. Occasionally, one or the other would stamp on the carpet or bite his lips to the quick or grasp the hilt of his sword so firmly that his hand paled. Their ordeal was the worse because they knew that Monsieur de Trivle's voice carried over into the antechamber. There, of course, the assembled musketeers had heard Monsieur de Trivle call for Athos. Portos and Aramis, and they judged from his tone of voice that he was exceeding wroth. Dozens of eavesdroppers glued their ears to the tapestry covering the partition, shuddering at what they heard. 
several glutters as near the keyhole as they could, and, by a relay system, repeated their leader's insults word for word for the benefit of the entire audience, in a trice, from the door of the captain's office to the gate on the street, the whole mansion was seething, so his majesty's musketeers arrested by the cardinal's guards, eh? At heart Monsieur de Treville was as furious as any of his soldiers, yet he clipped his words, wetting and sharpening them until they were so many stilettos plunged into the breasts of the culprits, yes, six of the cardinal's guards arrest six royal musketeers, God's death, I know what to do now, I shall go straight to the Louvre, submit my resignation as captain of the royal musketeers and apply for a lieutenant's commission in the cardinal's guards, and Marble, if he refuses, I will turn abbe. At these last words, the murmur outside, which had been steadily rising, crescendo, burst into a veritable explosion, jeers, oaths, curses and blasphemy rent the air, it was Marble here, sang to there. Mort's de Taus lay diables, upstairs and down, all over the mansion, with God and Satan serving with their bodily parts as pegs upon which to hang the most violent imprecations. Dardanian looked vainly about him for some curtain behind which to hide, failing to find any, he was seized with a wild desire to crawl under the table. I beg your pardon, Captain, said Portos, flaring up, but the truth is that we were evenly matched. Six to six, they set upon us treacherously and unawares. Before we could even draw our swords, two of our men were dead and Athos was grievously wounded. You know Athos, monsieur, well? Athos tried to get up on his feet twice and twice he fell down again. Meanwhile, we did not surrender, we were dragged forcibly away. Anyhow, before they got us in jail, we escaped. And Athos, well? Monsieur, they thought Athos dead and left him lying comfortably on the field of battle. What point was there in carrying off a corpse? There's the whole story for you. Devil take it, Captain. Nobody ever won all the battles he fought in. Pompey the Great lost the Battle of Pharsala, I think, and King Francis I, who so far as I have heard, was as good as the next man, suffered ignominious defeat at the Battle of Pavia. I have the honor to assure you, monsieur, that I killed one guardsman, with his own sword. Aramis put in, mine was broken at the first parry, I killed him or stabbed him, monsieur, it is for you to choose which terminology you prefer, monsieur de Treville appeared to be somewhat mollified, I did not know all this, he admitted, from what I now hear, I suppose his eminence was exaggerating. Profiting by the fact that his commanding officer seemed to have calmed down, Aramis hazarded. I beg you monsieur not to say that Athos is wounded. He would be desperately unhappy if the king should hear of it. The wound is a very serious one. The blade passed through his shoulder and penetrated into his chest, so it is to be feared that. Suddenly the door opened, the tapestry curtain was raised and a man stood on the threshold. He stood at attention, his noble head erect, his shoulders squared, his features word drawn, his face white. Athos, Athos, Monsieur de Treville echoed in amazement. My comrades told me you had sent for me, Captain, the newcomer said in a feeble yet perfectly even voice. So I came here to report to you. What is your pleasure, Monsieur? He was in regulation uniform, buttons ashen. Boots glittering, belted as usual for duty, every inch a soldier, with a tolerably firm step, he advanced into the room. Monsieur de Treville, deeply moved by this proof of courage, sprang to meet him. I was telling these gentlemen that I forbid my musketeers to expose their lives needlessly, he explained. Brave men are very dear to the king and his majesty knows that his musketeers are the bravest men on earth. Your hand, Athos and without waiting for the other's reaction, Monsieur de Treville seized his right hand and pressed it with all his might, in his enthusiasm he failed to notice that Athos, mastering himself as he did, could not check a twitch of pain, 
Athos turned even whiter than before. The arrival of Athos had created a sensation in the Hotel de Terrible. Despite the precautions his comrades had taken to keep his wounds a secret, news of his condition was common gossip. The door to Monsieur de Trivelles had remained open. His last words met with a burst of satisfaction in the antechamber. Jubilant, two or three musketeers poked their heads through the openings of the tapestry. Monsieur de Trivelles was about to reprimand this breach of discipline when he felt the hand of Athos stiffen and, looking up, realized that Athos was about to faint. At that moment, Athos rallied all his energy to struggle against pain, but he was at length overcome and fell to the floor like a dead man. A surgeon, Monsieur de Treville ordered, My surgeon or the king's, anyhow, the best surgeon you can find, God's blood, unless you fetch a surgeon, my brave Athos will die. At this, many of the musketeers outside rushed into Monsieur de Treville's office for he was too occupied with a thoughts to close the door upon them, and crowded around the wounded man. All this attention might have proved useless had not the physician so urgently summoned chance to be in the mansion. Elbowing his way through the throng, he approached Athos. The musketeer was still unconscious, and, as all this noise and commotion was inconvenient, the first and most urgent thing the doctor asked was that Athos be removed to an adjoining room. Monsieur de Treville immediately opened the door and pointed the way to Porthos and Aramis who carried off their comrade in their arms. Behind them walked the surgeon, and behind the surgeon, the door closed. Then, momentarily, Monsieur de Treville's office, usually a place held sacred, became an annex to the antechamber as everybody commented, harangued, vociferated, swore, cursed and consigned the cardinal and his guardsmen to all the devils. An instant after, Porthos and Aramis reappeared, leaving only the surgeon and Monsieur de Treville at their friend's side. Presently Monsieur de Treville himself returned. Athos, he said, had regained consciousness and, according to the surgeon, his condition need not worry his friends, his weakness was due wholly to loss of blood. Then the captain of musketeers dismissed the company with a wave of the hand and all withdrew save Dardanion, who did not forget that he had an audience and who, with Gaskin tenacity, sat tight. Pardon me, my dear compatriot, Monsieur de Treville said with a smile, pardon me but I had completely forgotten you. You can understand that. The captain is nothing but the father charged with an even greater responsibility than the father of an ordinary family. Soldiers are just big children. But as I insist on the orders of the king, and more particularly the orders of the cardinal, being carried out, Dardanian could not help smiling. Observing this Monsieur de Trivel judged that he was not dealing with a fool, and, changing the conversation, came straight to the point. I love your father dearly, he said, what can I do for his son, tell me quickly, for as you see my time is not my own, monsieur, Dardanian explained, on leaving Tarbes and coming here, I intended to request you, in remembrance of the friendship you have cited, to enroll me in the musketeers, but after what I have seen, here during the last two hours, I understand what a tremendous favor this would be. I am afraid I do not deserve it. It is indeed a favor, young man, but perhaps not so far beyond your hopes as you believe or affect to believe. At all events, His Majesty's regulations are explicit on that point. I am sorry to have to tell you that no one is admitted to the musketeers unless he has fought in several campaigns or performed certain brilliant feats or served at least two years in some other regiment less favored than ours. Dardanian bowed without replying, disappointed as he was, the difficulties to be surmounted before becoming a musketeer made him all the more eager to achieve this, Monsieur de Treville fixed a sharp, piercing glance upon his compatriot as though to read his inmost thoughts and continued, however, on account of my old comrade, your father, I want to do something for you, 
As I said, our youths from Bern are usually none too well off nor have I any reason to suspect that things have changed much since I myself left the province. I dare say you haven't brought any too much money up with you? Dardanian drew himself up proudly. His expression indicated clearly that he accepted alms of no man. Very well, young man, I understand, Monsieur de Trivel observed. I know those errors. I myself descended upon Paris with four crowns in my purse and I would have fought with anybody who suggested that I could not buy up the Louvre. Dardanian drew himself up even more proudly as he realized that thanks to the sale of his nag, he was beginning his career with four crowns more than Monsieur de Trivel had possessed in similar circumstances. You ought, I say, to husband your resources however great they may be, but you ought also to perfect yourself in exercises befitting a gentleman. I shall write a letter today to the director of the Royal Military Academy and he will admit you tomorrow at no expense to yourself. Do not refuse this small favor. Our best born and wealthiest gentleman sometimes solicited it in vain. You will learn horsemanship, swordsmanship of all sorts, and dancing. You will make desirable acquaintances there and you can call on me from time to time to tell me how you are getting along and whether I can be of further service to you, Dardanian, though a stranger to the manners of the court, could not help feeling a certain coldness in this reception. Alas! Monsieur, he mourned, my father gave me a letter of introduction to present to you. Now I realize how much it would help me. I am indeed surprised that you should undertake so long a journey without that viaticum, that indispensable passport, which is the sole resource we Perburnize possess. I had one, Monsieur, and by God, the finest I could wish for but it was treacherously stolen from me, and he proceeded to relate the adventure of Moong, describing the unknown gentleman with the minutest detail and with a warmth and truthfulness that delighted Monsieur de Trivel. This is all very curious, Monsieur de Trivel declared after a moment's reflection. You mentioned my name aloud then? Yes, Monsieur. I confess I committed that imprudence, but why not? A name like yours must needs serve me as a shield on my journey. You will judge whether I often availed myself of its protection. Flattery was very current in those days and Monsieur de Trèves loved in sense as well as any king or cardinal. He could not restrain a smile of obvious satisfaction, but this smile soon disappeared. Returning to the adventure of Moong, tell me, he asked, did this gentleman have a slight scar on his cheek? Yes, the kind of scar he might have if a bullet had grazed him. Dot wasn't he a fine looking man? Yes, splendid. Tall? A. Eh? Fair complexion. Brown hair? Yes, monsieur. That's right. That's the man. How do you know him so well? If ever I find him again, and I will find him, I swear, even in hell. He was waiting for a lady? Yes and he left after talking to her for a few moments. Do you happen to know what they talked about? He gave her a box, told her it contained her instructions, and admonished her not to open it until she reached London. Was this woman English? He called her my lady. It is he, it is he, Trivel murmured. I thought he was still at Brussels. Oh, monsieur, if you know who this man is, Pray tell me who he is and where he comes from. This would be the greatest favor you could possibly do me, if you will. Then I shall release you from all your promises, even that of helping me eventually to join the musketeers. The only thing I ask of life is to avenge myself. Beware of trying any such thing, young man, Trivel cautioned. On the contrary, if you ever see him on one side of the street, make sure to cross to the other. Do not throw yourself against such a rock, it would smash you like glass. That will not prevent me, if ever I meet him, from, suddenly trivialed Dardanian suspiciously. Treachery might well lurk behind the fierce hatred the young traveler professed for the man who had stolen his father's letter, or so he said. Besides, this theft seemed an improbable thing at best. Might not his eminence have sent this youth to set a trap for Trivel? 
wasn't this pretended Dardanian an emissary whom the cardinal sought to introduce into Trivial's household so that he might be close to him, win his confidence and then ruin him? The cardinal had played this trick in a thousand other instances, looking at Dardanian even more searchingly than before. Monsieur de Trivial was but moderately reassured by his expression, alive with astute intelligence and affected humility. I know he's a Gascon, he mused, but he may be as much of a Gascon for Monsignor Cardinal as he is for me. I shall test him. His eyes fixed upon Dardanians. He spoke slowly, My boy, your father was my old friend and comrade. I believe this story of the lost letter to be perfectly true and I should like to dispel the impression of coldness you may have remarked in my welcome. Perhaps the best way to do so would be to discover to you, a novice as I once was myself, the secrets of our policy today. He then went on to explain to Dardanian how the king and the cardinal were the best of friends. Their apparent bickering was only a stratagem intended to deceive fools. Monsieur de Trivial was unwilling that a compatriot, a dashing cavalier and a youth of high metal, should be duped by such artifices and fall into the snare, as so many others had done before him to their ruin, he assured Dardanian of his devotion to both these all-powerful masters, he insisted that his most earnest endeavor was to serve both the king and the cardinal, his eminence, he added, was one of the most illustrious geniuses France had ever produced. Now, young man, rule your conduct accordingly. If for family reasons or through your friends or through your own instincts, even, you entertain such enmity for the cardinal as we are constantly discovering, then let us bid each other adieu, I will help you as much as I can but without attaching you to my person. There was a long pause, I hope my frankness will at least make you my friend, Monsieur de Trivial said at last, because you are the only young man to whom I have ever spoken like this. Trivial was thinking, the cardinal knows how bitterly I loathe him, if he has set this young fox upon me, then he cannot have failed to indicate the best means of winning my favor, this spy, therefore, has been primed to rail at Richelieu for my benefit, if my suspicions are well founded, my hypocritical protestations of loyalty to Richelieu should move this crafty youth to loose a torrent of abuse against his eminence. But Monsieur de Trivial's calculations proved to be wrong. I came to Paris with just the intentions you advised me to harbor. Monsieur, he replied candidly, my father warned me to follow nobody but His Majesty, Monsignor Cardinal, and yourself, whom he considered the three leading personages in the realm of France. Monsieur Dardanian the Elder had indicated only Louis XIII and Richelieu but his son thought the addition of Monsieur de Trivial would do no harm. I have the greatest reverence for the cardinal and the most profound respect for his actions, he continued, so much the better for me. Monsieur, if as you say, you are speaking to me frankly, because, by so doing, you pay me the honor of sharing my opinion, so much the worse for me if you mistrust me, as well you may because then I am damning myself in your eyes for speaking the truth. Still, I trust you will not esteem me any the less for my frankness since your esteem is the thing I hold dearest in life. Monsieur de Trivial was overwhelmed with surprise. Such penetration and sincerity won his admiration but did not wholly dissipate his suspicions. The more this youth excelled others the more dangerous he was if Trivial misjudged him. Nevertheless, he pressed Dardanian's hand, saying, You are an honest lad, but at present I can do for you no more than what I just offered. The Hotel de Trivial will always be open to you. In time, you will have a chance to ask for me at all hours. Consequently you will be able to take advantage of all available opportunities and you will probably achieve what you desire. You mean? Monsieur, when I have proved myself worthy, said Dardanion, and, with all the familiarity of Gascon to Gascon, well, you may rest assured, you will not have to wait long, whereupon he bowed, to take his leave.
as if he considered the future so much putty in his hands to shape as he willed. Wait, wait, Monsieur de Treve laid a hand on his arm. I promised you a letter to the director of the Royal Academy. Are you too proud to accept it, my lad? No, Monsieur, and I guarantee this letter will not fare like my father's. I will guard it so carefully that I swear it will be delivered. If anyone attempts to take it from me, may God have mercy on his soul. Smiling at this extravagance, Monsieur de Trivel left D'Artagnan in the embrasure of the window, where they had been chatting, and moved to his desk to write the promised letter. While he was doing this, D'Artagnan, with nothing to occupy him, drummed a tattoo on the window pane and amused himself by watching the musketeers as they left the building, one by one, until turning the corner, they vanished. The letter finished, Monsieur de Trivel sealed it, rose and advanced, toward Dardanion, who stretched out his hand to receive it, suddenly, to Monsieur de Trivel's amazement, his protege turned crimson with fury, God's blood, dot what's the matter? Dardanion leapt across the room crying, God's blood, he'll not slip through my fingers this time, who, my thief, Dardanian shouted as he rushed from the room, ah, coward, traitor, at last, devil take that madman, Monsieur de Trivel grumbled, unless, failing in his mission, he is making a highly strategic escape, he is making a highly strategic escape, he is making a highly strategic